Hey, I'm going to ask if you'd remain standing for the reading of Scripture. We stand for the Word of God, acknowledging this is not an ordinary book, but this is the very Word of God to us in our lives today. Uh, we've got a fun relationship here at Be Hope that I have people stand for the reading of Scripture, and everybody quietly hopes that the number of verses is very, very small. They're willing to stand, but they hope it's not for long. So for best weekend ever, I got one verse, one I'd like to read over you. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. The Apostle Paul, who is a hero of the New Testament, plants churches all over the known world in the first century, writes a letter to his protege, to a leader who is young in the faith by the name of Timothy, giving him instructions on how to live, on how to lead, on how to walk out this life of faith. Towards the end of this letter, this is what Paul pens to Timothy. Fight, the good fight, of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of the faith. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the good fight. There's a lot of fighting. Everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, there's a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, a lot of frustration. Our world is engulfed in battles of ideology and ideas, of perspectives and politics. And today I'd like to bring some clarity to that. And so we're gonna talk about the good fight. If you would do this for me before you grab a seat, would you turn to three people around you and say, I hope you're ready to fight. <laughs> and then you can grab a seat wherever you are. I had a, uh, years ago, I had a mentor uh, use the metaphor of a rubber band to explain the tension in life. And it has stuck with me to this day. I explain this to our kids. I bring this up before our team all the time. And he said, life, navigating life, engaging life is about understanding how a rubber band functions. He says, the first part you have is you have currently where you are. Your, your habits, your behaviors, how you're living, the current circumstances of the life that you're in. But on the other side of the rubber band is your desired future. Your expectations about the future, your hopes for the future, everything you think the future in your life is going to be and the life that you're going to engage in. He said, life is about navigating the tension of this rubber band. If the desired future gets too far away from current reality, you're going to snap. If your expectations of your career, if your expectations of your spouse get too far removed from where things currently are, oh man, you will be filled with frustration and you will not be able to handle that amount of tension. But at the same time, he said the key to life is not by pulling these things completely close. Because when the desired future is the same as current reality, when your hopes and your dreams and expectations are the same as the life that you're currently living, there's no tension and nothing gets better. He said, you're, you're functionally dead. You're making no difference. Your life is the same every single day. You need something to pull you forward, something to pull you forward in the future without causing you to snap. For some of you, I have just explained why you are so frustrated in the life that you're living. You're going, oh, that's the problem. My rubber band is too tight. Or maybe I'm not motivated. My rubber band is full of slack and I need some tension. He said, life is about navigating this tension. And within this metaphor was this truth, this important truth. And that is that you are wired for the fight. It's part of life. You are meant for the battle. And, and, and some of us, we think like, oh, I don't, I don't want to fight. I don't like to fight. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm tired of the struggle of life. That is to negate your wiring. That is to go against how you have been specifically designed. Uh, one of my favorite books is by the author M. Scott Peck, and he begins the book with this line, life is hard, and as soon as you accept that, life's not so hard. I tell you what, I didn't need to read the rest of the book. I was, I was like, that's a lot. I need to deal with that for a little bit. But it is this understanding. Life is difficult. 
It's a fight. Relationships are a fight. Career, purpose, meaning, belonging. These things are a battle. And you are not meant to shrink back from it. And sometimes we like split people up into categories and we're like, well, you just really like conflict. I don't really, I don't really like conflict. And those of us who don't really like conflict, we're not wired for the fight. That's not what we're supposed to be. I, I want to let you know, first off, I love conflict. I am fascinated by it. Some of you think I'm like a sadist. I'm like, something's wrong with me in there. Like, no, no, trust me. Like, I think it's amazing. If there's an argument, I'm going to show up. I don't even care what we're arguing about. If I'm driving down the road and something is on fire, I'm just going to go to see what's on fire. I'm probably not going to help. I'm not able to help. There's nothing I can do. I just want to go, something's burning. Let's watch. I was in a meeting recently with a bunch of different leaders from different backgrounds. And it was a, it was a meeting over some conflict of opinion and conflict over the future and what we thought the future should be looking like. And several times throughout this meeting, different people said, listen, no one wants to be here. None of us want to be here. And like the fourth time that someone said, listen, none of us want to be here, I just interrupted them. And I said, hey, I just want to be honest. You guys keep saying no one wants to be here. I'm actually thrilled that I'm here. I actually really didn't even know what this whole meeting was about. I just heard it was going to be contentious. And so I showed up anyway. Okay, that's how I'm wired. I want you to know that. And that may not be you, but there's still something that you're willing to fight about, like like, like if someone gets in your face, you may be willing to fight. If someone tells off your kid, you're willing to fight. If you're in the drive through and the person who's in the other line goes in front of you, even though it's rightfully your turn, you're going to fight. I don't care if you're Mother Teresa, you're going to fight. You're ready to go on that. You are wired for the fight. It's part of life. But here's the important thing, is that Paul mentions the good fight. He clarifies to Timothy, he, his protege, he says, you need to fight the good fight. Because if you don't fight the good fight and you end up fighting the bad fight, you're going to give your life to something that doesn't matter. And there would be no more heartbreaking thing than to find out at the end of your life, you expended all of your effort and all of your energy and all of your thoughts and all of your resources on something that didn't make a difference. You're wired for the fight, but it is essential that you actually fight the good fight. And that's what I want for you today. So for the sake of clarity, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to walk you through three different principles that are so evident in this single verse that I do not want them to miss. I do not want you to miss them. If there is any risk that you're going to miss them, we're going to put them on the screen in big letters behind me. Okay. I want to help you fight the good fight. The first thing we learn from Paul's letter to Timothy, if there's a good fight, there's a bad fight. If he clarifies, fight the good fight, it means there's a bad fight. There's a fight that you shouldn't fight. Every single one of us had at a point in our lives when we were younger, needed adults to come into our lives to tell us that we should care about things we currently did not care about. This is important. You need to wash behind your ears. No four-year-old cares about washing behind their ears. You should floss. I'm, I'm still there, <laughs> to be clear. Like, yeah, I get it. Hygienist like, gives me the shame question. Like, when did you last floss? I'm like, you know. Why are you acting like this? You know I'm a pastor too. Do you just want to see if I'm going to lie in this moment? Like, when did you last floss? Oh, last time I saw you. Thank you very much. Okay. Like you need adults to come into your life to tell you what you should care about. Saturday in our house is cleaning day. We make all our kids clean their rooms and bathrooms and all that stuff. And they don't care about cleaning their sink. And we have to come in. They're like, no, you need to clean their, your sink. And they're like, why? And like, Because you have toothpaste that is now stuck on dried toothpaste. Like at this rate, there will be no sink left. This is important. This is disgusting. And they don't care. And so you have to tell them, no, this matters. But at some point in time, you need to graduate from that. At some point in time, you need to graduate from other people's opinion of what matters always becoming your own. And for some of us, that hasn't happened. We're so worried about what other people think is important that we've never defined for ourselves what we think is important. 
And anytime another parent or a friend says, oh, I'm going to this, or my kid's in this, or they're a part of this, we think, should ours be a part of that? Is that important? I don't feel like I care, but if they care, I feel like I should care. See, we're we're not even into the good fight now. We're just trying to identify the bad fight. And I'm going to give you this if you're taking notes. This is the way that you know the bad fight clearer than any other time. If it's about what you're fighting against, instead of who you're fighting for, it's the bad fight. If, if the fight is centered around who's wrong, why they're wrong, why they're the problem, why they're the enemy, it's the bad fight. You have no business engaging in that fight. If you turn on your TV at any point in time in the day, there will be people there to tell you who is the enemy and why they're wrong. If you turn on CNN, it's the Republicans. If you turn on Fox News, it's the Liberals. If you turn on ESPN, it's the Dallas Cowboys, which is something I could kind of get behind if I could let you know that. Kind of with you a little bit there. No offense, Cowboys fans, but you could go away and we'd all be better for it. (laughs) If the fight is about who you're against instead of who you're for, what you're against instead of who you're for, it's the bad fight. It's not worth fighting. Second thing that Paul shows Timothy about the fight. Just because I'm right doesn't mean it's the good fight. I need this to sink in as deep as it can, okay? So I need you to turn to your neighbor and say, just because I'm right, moderate response. We're going to try that again. We participate together. Turn to your neighbor. Just because I'm right doesn't mean it's the good fight. You may be correct. That doesn't mean you should engage in it. Uh, we, we have this issue uh, right now. One of our kids is in elementary school, and they have more homework than any kid that age should. They just have tons of homework. It's an unreal amount of homework. And so my wife and I have talked about it and focused and like had a couple discussions on it. Uh, the last bit of homework that she got, I got a six out of 10 on it, which that was a little bit of a blow to the ego. Like I have my master's and stuff. I was like, wow, I got a six out of 10 on this. Jeez, old Pete, this is tough. And so we've like had discussions and we've had to come to the conclusion. This is not a fight that we're willing to fight. Now I think we're right. I know we're right. <laughs> But it's not a battle we're willing to fight. I'm not willing to spend my influence on that. I'm not willing to spend my time on that. And so we've had to go, listen to our kid. You're either going to have to learn incredible time management and how to work really hard, or you're going to have to get comfortable with a C. Some of you parents, you're like, listen, no one's exceptional in everything. That's a good lesson to go, hey, you can be average in this, so you can be great at these other things. I'm okay with her learning one of those two lessons early on. Just because you're right doesn't mean it's the good fight. My wife and I have a disagreement as to how dishes should be done. I think you should wash the dishes in the sink dry them with a towel and put them all away so the counter is clean and the job is finished. She thinks you should wash the dishes in the sink and then leave them on the counter forever to dry. And I go, the dishes aren't done. And she goes, yeah, they're air drying. And I think, do you just like, every time you get out of the shower, you don't use a towel, you just air dry for days? Is that what happens? No, treat the dishes with the same level of respect that you do your body. Like, can we speed this process up a little bit? But it's not worth fighting, so I don't bring it up. (laughs) Just to be clear, she worked on that illustration with me. Some of you are like, you idiot. She worked on that illustration with me. We're good. Just because you're right doesn't mean it's worth the fight. It, the concept in battle used to be this, that we understood that there should be hills that you're willing to die on. Hills that you don't retreat from. In, in our own history, George Washington actually lost more battles than he won because he knew when it was acceptable to retreat and when there would be a spot in which he would retreat no more. We have lost that idea in our culture today. Every hill is a hill we're willing to die on. Every hill is something we're willing to ruin the relationship for, to lose our influence over. We're willing to comment on absolutely everything. If you're willing to die on every hill, you're gonna get bloody for no reason. 
You're going to find relationships destroyed, communities wrecked, families broken over things that don't matter most. I didn't say they don't matter, but don't matter most. We see this incredible scene from the life of Jesus recorded for us in John chapter 8. This is what it says. At dawn, he, being Jesus, appeared in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery in the law. Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, there's a thousand questions about this passage that should pop up. One of most importance to me is, where's the man? It takes two to be caught in the act of adultery. What happened there? But they're using this to trap Jesus. There is also this piece in which we look at this passage and we go, how cruel of their culture that they would stone someone for this act. But, but if I could just acknowledge, while what may seem cruel to them seem cruel to us that's normalized in their culture that there are things in our culture that would seem cruel to them like like the fact that what someone might have put on social media 20 years ago when they are in high school would cause us to cancel them from all culture and show no grace whatsoever would I think be a little cruel to them in the same boat so we all have our own version of cruel don't judge too harshly it says now what do you say They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. I've heard uh, pastors for years, they've, they've tried to imagine what Jesus wrote in the ground. Uh, one of my favorite theories that people have said is, I think he wrote their sins in the ground. He wrote all the things that they did wrong in the ground. I have my own theory as to what Jesus wrote in the ground. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I think that if it mattered, they would have told us. <laughs> like if it was important in any way what Jesus wrote in the ground... They would have informed us what it was, but instead these religious leaders gather around and they ask Jesus this pivotal question and he goes, maybe maybe drew a picture, maybe played some tic-tac-toe with the Holy Spirit, I don't know, something like that. It's like, Peter, you want to play mash? Mansion, apartment, shack, house. How many kids you want, Peter? Sorry, anyone else play mash? That was the best back in the day. <laughs> Sorry. He just drew in the ground. And they're all standing there waiting for a response. And he doesn't answer. Some of us need to learn this lesson. Silence is an acceptable response. Silence is a perfectly satisfactory response. Not everything that gets thrown your way do you need to respond to. You don't swing at pitches in the dirt, okay? (laughs) Just because someone asks your opinion or is given the opportunity for you to present your opinion doesn't mean you have to answer. And you might be right. Oh, you might be right. But that doesn't mean it's the good fight. You become aware that this matters more than my opinion on this. This other thing is more significant than just what I feel about this in this moment. Some conversations don't need to take place just because someone asks your opinion. Just because you're right doesn't mean it's the good fight. Third thing we learn from Paul's letter to Timothy is that the good fight is the fight of faith. I want to show you what Jesus does because it's brilliant because he is the son of God. After he stoops down and begins writing on the ground with his finger, verse 7, it says, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. 
Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. It is amazing to note what Jesus does for two different groups. The woman, yes, but first, the mob. Jesus looks at this group that is angry, that is ready for murder, and he restores back to them their humanity. He he takes them from a mob that is enraged back to individuals. See, we often think that what Jesus does in this moment is simply acting for the redemption of the woman. But what Jesus is also doing in this moment is acting in redemption for the group. And we know that he moves them from a mob back to individuals because it says that they all walk away one at a time. As long as the stone is in your hand, as long as you are focused and convinced on what is wrong with others, what is broken with others, why they're the problem. You cannot deal with what is broken within you. You cannot deal with what is hurting within you. You cannot deal with what needs to be redeemed within you. And so without a single weapon, Jesus fights the good fight because he causes them to drop the stone from their hand. Some of you came in here today angry, Maybe at a group, maybe at an individual. And the problem is, is that the anger that will consume your soul will not lead to the life that you desire. And everything else in our world will try to justify your anger and tell you how right you are and how you should feel that way. And they are the problem. And as long as that is the case, you cannot deal with what's broken within you. And you cannot become acutely aware of what God has done for you. See, you have value and meaning and worth, not based upon any accomplishment or anything that you have done, but because you are created by an almighty, most loving God. It is hardwired into your DNA, a part of your very being. You don't have to do anything that establishes your significance. It's already there and you'll miss it if you're focused on what's wrong with everyone else. Starting next week, we're jumping into a series titled Kingdom Culture in which we're going to look at the kind of people that we're called to become. And if you're a part of Be Hope Church for any period of time, the person who you will be developed into, the kind of person that you will become. And we're going to look at these six different characteristics of those who follow Jesus. And I want to show you my favorite one today because it's important for this message on the woman caught in adultery. And it reads like this. We own our part. We acknowledge that we are both the potential problem and the future solution. We are imperfect people seeking for God to transform us every day. We are not a church that gathers around to complain about how bad the world is. We are not a people who comes around and says, well, they're wrong and they're wrong and they're wrong. We are a people who acknowledge and confesses that the same thing that is wrong with the world lives deep within us. And until I have done the work of accepting God in those areas of my life, I am only going to compound the problem. And so if I want to be a part of the solution, first, I need to come to Jesus. Jesus takes the mob, the, the, the group think, the mob mentality, the identity politics. And he says, no, this is not where you're meant to live. This is not who you're supposed to be. And he restores to them their status as individuals. And then he looks at the woman. And so often we misread Jesus's words because we hear what he says to her as, has no one condemned you? She says, no. And and then we read into Jesus's words, this response, well, then you're fine. Go on your way. That is not what he says to her. He says, has no one condemned you? Then neither do I. He looks at you and he says, I don't condemn you. But then he gives this incredibly high call. 
leave this life. Don't live this way. This is not what you're meant for. You were created for more than this. So please don't stay stuck here. The statement of I don't condemn you is not a statement of I affirm everything that you're doing. Those are not the same. It is a statement of you've been created for more than this. And yet I do not heap shame and guilt upon you. I want to lead you into wholeness and health. I want to lead you to myself. Go. Leave your life. Of sin. See, this is the good fight. The good fight is understanding that you have value in God and that your life was meant to be lived in Him. The good fight is understanding that you have an opportunity to, to contribute to what will become best in the world as you live out that purpose in your life. And as long as you stay focused on what is wrong and pointing out who is wrong, You'll be fighting the bad fight. You'll contribute to what is worst, what is hurting, what is broken, and what needs healed. The Apostle Paul writes another letter to Timothy. This is at the end of his life, and a second letter that we have from Paul to Timothy. And he writes this at the very end of the letter. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is what I want for you. I want you to be able to look back at your life and to be able to go, yes, it was a fight. It will always be a fight, but I fought the good fight. I fought the one that mattered. I fought the one that made a difference. I, I expended the energy of my life into something that had eternal significance. I did not waste it on what was passing. And I did not unnecessarily spend my influence because I was right. But I did it in something that was worthy. I want that for you. But this is what I know. Is you can't do that without Jesus. You can't do that without God in your life. It's impossible. You're, you're going to become focused on the ways in which you're right instead of what is worthy. And you're going to fight the bad fight. You're going to become focused on who you're fighting with instead of what you're fighting for. And it'll become the bad fight. You'll be obsessed on just picking a fight. And you'll become a bully instead of the warrior that God called you to be. And that's the bad fight. You need his spirit to guide you. You need his strength to empower you and you need his wisdom to direct you in all the days of your life there is no good fight without Jesus in your life and your life matters too much to spend it in something that doesn't matter church would you stand with me in this moment and so I want to invite you to enter into a relationship with Jesus to, to understand that we are all broken. We have all done wrong. That we need his forgiveness in our life to restore a relationship with him. We need his spirit in our life to guide us. And then he offers us a place with him forever in heaven for eternity. See, the good fight begins with claiming what God has done. You don't have to win it because you can't win it. You're never good enough to win it. It's receiving what God has done and asking his spirit to live in your life to do what only he can do. How does the world get better? Because if I could just be blunt, it's kind of getting worse. <laughs> How does the world get better? More people willing to fight the good fight. More people engaged in fighting the good fight. I have had enough. Like, I can't even begin. Like, I have had enough of people heaping shame upon others because they dislike the decisions that they're making because they come in disagreement to their own opinions. If we keep going down this path, we're not going to be in a good spot because we have somehow as a culture decided, you only matter if you agree with me. Your opinion should only be heard if it is the same as my own. And this is not the gospel of Jesus. This is not what Jesus did on our behalf. Your 
Your worth is in the cross. Your value is found in Him alone. Amen. Amen. So, I want to invite you. If you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. So we pray a prayer together every week. I'm going to say a couple words, invite you to repeat after me. And all those who have already made this decision will pray this prayer with you because this is the foundation of our faith, the confirmation of what we say. In it. And, and who knows, if you make this decision, and your forgiveness is given, your sins are removed, your relationship restored, heaven prepared for you, and you are engaged in the good fight. One might even call a moment like that your best weekend ever. This is why we're here at church. This is what we do best. So I wanna invite you, if that's you, and you'd like to enter into a relationship with Jesus, if you'd repeat after me. Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that He gave His life to forgive my sins and was raised from the grave so that I may have life. I receive Your grace by faith. Come into my life. I will follow You. Amen. Come on, somebody. Let's celebrate that together. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today at our Be Hope Church YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button below so you never miss a video. And you can join us every Sunday online at behope.online or you can like our Facebook page or participate in our online community through our Facebook group. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please subscribe, share, and review this. Make sure you invite a friend into what's going on. And if you want to support the ministry here at Be Hope, you can learn how to become a First Church champion by going to behope.church slash giving. Thank you so much for being a part of what we do, and we'll see you back here real soon.